Well, uh, outside of my wife, I'll stand in the light here. Outside of my wife and beautiful three little kids, uh, one of the things that really gives me a lot of joy in life is to create experiences for people that allow them to kind of rip them out of their everyday life and into a moment where they can they can experience some joy or some beauty or possibly meaning and and something profound. And this didn't exactly happen in a profound way. It, it actually happened by uh, playing with a bunch of bottles. And um, I don't know, have you guys ever heard of Galco's? Galco's is in uh, um, Highland Park here in, in uh, LA, and they sell 400 kinds of soda pop. I'm not a big soda drinker, but you know, if there's 50 kinds of root beer, it's kind of fun to look at them. And, and um, I, was, I was doing a project at Art Center College of Design, that's where I, I studied graphic design there, and I had a professor there that uh, said, you know, you're just too practical. Everything you do is too practical. You need to just go have fun because the practicality kind of puts you in a box and doesn't allow you to be creative. And, and I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. I can just go play, this is kind of fun. So uh, I was gonna do this project on this uh, grocery store and sort of the essence of this grocery store besides this amazing fellow right here, John Neese, is that everything they have is in bottles and it's used and they, they use uh, sugar cane in it instead of uh, sugar cane sugar instead of uh, putting something in an aluminum can with uh, corn syrup and it just tastes a lot better. So I thought, okay, I'm going to play with uh, play with bottles. And so I started to kind of make little sculptures and light them in different ways. And I thought that was kind of fun. And I thought, well, what if you could, you know, put them all on top of this building and maybe you could light them up in some interesting way? That would be kind of fun. And then I love the sound of bottles. You know, when you blow on them and you know, it's beautiful noise. And I thought, you know. Uh, maybe I could drive around town with these bottles on top of my car. And, and uh, I don't know if you can see my, my little notes here. I say it uh, does not work. It looks pretty cool, though. So, <laughs> so uh, then I got my friend, and I said, hey, could you like push these things up and down for me? And, and uh, that didn't work either. But eventually, I got this, this, the right angle, the right distance, and it made a beautiful noise. And it it go... Woo, 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 woo. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I made like a taco truck stand and, uh, and it would drive around town and, and it'd make music for this grocery store just like, you guys are all laughing. Yeah. Um, I think this is cool. So, so anyways, uh, just like an ice cream truck drives around and makes music, couldn't they you know, have something like that? That'd be kind of fun. And a friend of mine, she happens to have perfect pitch. And I thought, uh, she, she, she said, hey, you know, I could make you a perfect scale out of all these different bottles because they're all different sizes. And, and you know, I, I know nothing about music, but I thought um, maybe I could make a pipe organ out of it. And, <laughs> and um, this is sort of the way I live is that I have no idea how to do anything usually, but I, I ask a lot of questions and I usually find people who can help me figure things out. And so for my graduation show, I had this pipe organ that looked like this wild science experiment, which is kind of fun. And so, you know, more ideas, you know, you could make uh, tambourines and xylophones and all sorts of different stuff like that. And so uh, while I was at Art Center, uh, one of my uh, halfway through, I had this opportunity to hear a, um, an artist that is actually working at Caltech. And it really kind of changed my, my, my thinking. And uh, he, he looked at that and he said, okay, you're gonna do the same thing uh, as that bottle project, except you're gonna do it here. I don't know why it keeps going off, but anyways. Um, but you're gonna like swim like an otter for half an hour a day and you're gonna help us come up with ways of visualizing really complex data. And I said, wow, that sounds really cool. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately I don't have a whole lot of time to go into the data aspect of things, but um, this experience really changed my life. It was the first time I had really interacted with a lot of scientists and it was also the first time that I had ever seen artists working with scientists. And so from that moment on I said, you know, scientists work with these big ideas and, and they're really profound. And you know, I, I said at the beginning, those are the types of things I'd like to deal with. And so I said, you know, I'm gonna try to find a research center that I could work at. And um, which sort of led me to this place. Uh, this is a little bit north of the Rose Bowl. This is the Jet Propulsion Lab. There's about 5,000 people there, 3,000 engineers and about 300 scientists. And um, I'm the only person there like me. <laughs> so um, if you don't know much about JPL, uh, basically they're hallowed ground for space exploration. They study the Earth. There's probably uh, 15 different instruments studying the Earth in lots of different ways. Go to all the different planets. Uh, pretty soon we're gonna 
go to Mars with this, uh, this next rover. This is the next rover that's going to go to Mars. And we study things uh, outside the solar system as well. And so, you know, a, a reasonable person might ask, you know, how did you get there, <laughs> you know? And so this is like the normal path to JPL. And I thought, well, maybe there's a different, a different route there. And, uh, and so I, I sort of... Yeah, well, I'll let you, yeah. I, I find a different route. So, um, <laughs> and so I, I had like two minutes. I, I had this great opportunity to talk to the director of JPL, and I had two minutes, and I, uh, I, I basically said it'd be great to work here, and he said that would be great too, and then he left. And, and he's the kind of guy that um, he travels like 200,000 miles a year, and you know, he's just not very easy to get a hold of. So this, uh, this last thing right here, this is a, a good idea. Um, I'd been sending my resume out in Next Day Air because, you know, it's hard not to open that. You know, someone spent the money and it seems important versus a, a little letter. And so um, I wasn't around and my wife was going to send my resume and uh, they didn't have any letter size ones. They only had these giant envelopes. <laughs> and so fortunately she sent that uh, just like that and so it caught his attention. and. And he sent it on to some other people, and they said, oh, well, maybe you could do animations for us. And I said, you know, I would do anything to work here, but, uh, you know, this bottle stuff is what I'm really <laughs> passionate about. <laughs> and so, you know, he looked at me, and he said, well, you know, uh, I don't really understand what you do, but it's pretty cool. And uh, you have six months. Go do whatever you do, and we'll see what happens. And that was five years ago. So it was kind of cool. So... Uh, when, when I first got there, one of the big things that they were working with was this idea of finding planets around other stars. And to me, that's just mind-boggling, to find planets around other stars, and then not only planets, but Earth-like planets. That's what they really want to find. And so uh, they, they, they'd throw out all these numbers about billions of stars and billions of galaxies, and, and it was all like, you know, I wasn't very good at math, so it was all a little too much for me. And so I thought, I really need to make an experience so I can experience these numbers. So, so here's the numbers. So if, there's a, if a grain of sand were a galaxy, so a galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars in it, you'd need six roomfuls of sand to show all the galaxies in the known universe. So um, I kind of have all the sand sitting around, and uh, there's a magnifying glass, and uh, you look in this magnifying glass, and in there is a single grain of sand, which is going to represent our galaxy. And what's cool about being at JPL is that uh, you can go there and say, hey, could you drill a hole into this grain of sand for me? <laughs> and uh, the guy kind of looks at me kind of funny, and then the other guy next to him is like, yeah, that'd be cool. Let's try to do that. So. <laughs> So I don't know if you can see it here. This is the magnifying glass. This is the grain of sand. And there's a little tiny hole there. And so that's a tenth of a millimeter. And uh, so if this were our galaxy, so far, almost 400 planets have been found within that little tiny area of our galaxy, let alone all the other galaxies. And that's mainly only because we can only see giant things, and over the next few years, we're going to find thousands and thousands more, and hopefully someday we'll have the technology to see things that are really small. So I like to create experiences that kind of make you go, oh, you know, it's hard to think about. And, um, I actually showed this to a lady one time, and uh, it was, it's on my business card, and she literally wouldn't talk to me, because <laughs> every time she looked at me, her head hurt. So um, the other aspect of finding planets that's really difficult is that stars are really big, and they're really bright, and the things that you're looking for are really small and really dim. So we have to come up with some way of blocking out a really bright light to see a dim light. And so I've created uh, this installation. And uh, I have a giant light, and I shine it against a wall or a screen. And at the same time, I project a movie against that same surface. But you can't see the movie because this other light is so bright. But everyone loves to see their shadow. Or some, there's always some fool that will walk in and go like this. And then they, they notice something, and, and inside of your shadow, you can see the movie. And uh, what's really, what I love about this is that people that would never stand next to each other kind of will, you know, stand next to each other because you need to, like, block out the whole thing if you really want to look at it. So from a community standpoint, this is kind of a lot of fun to, to watch, watch happen. So these are some of the things I've, I, I do at JPL. I've gotten to go to festivals and, and uh, art museums and stuff, kind of showing 
ideas that JPL is working with. Um, but I also do a lot of things on the outside of JPL, and I was asked to do an installation a little while ago. And uh, this one, you know, when you, when you look up at the sky and you see the stars, I know it's hard to see in LA, but sometimes you can see stars up there, and when there's more than one or two of them up there, uh, they all look like they're on the same plane. And, and the ancients used to think that there were, there were these uh, big spheres that all the, all the stars were on. And, and, but in reality, they're all vastly different sizes and distances away. And they're so far away that they're actually different times away. So if something is 100 light years away, it takes 100 years for that light to get here. If it's a billion light years away, it's a billion. You know, you're looking at light that, that started a billion years ago. So you, you, uh, you might think about the actions that you take right now, and you know, people might be seeing that for a long time somewhere else. Anyway, so I really wanted to get this idea across. And, and um, so you walk into this space that looks like this flat clock, but as you walk into it, you realize that they're all these disks that are different sizes and different distances away. And it's sort of like walking into a Dali painting in, in some sense. And uh, then you walk back and, and it all becomes flat again. And, uh, you know, as you walk through, there's uh, some happy mistakes where we had these really kind of cool shadows on, on the wall and that was completely by accident. And, um, but on the back of each one of these discs is a speaker. And when you came in the room, you kind of hear all these voices and you're not really sure what it's all about. Uh, but you kind of see the speakers and you hear things. And then eventually you, um, uh, you see a little microphone. And when you speak into the microphone, normally you think that something's going to happen right away. But it doesn't. Um, when you speak in it, about 10 seconds later, you hear what you just said. And then about 30 seconds later, you hear what you said. And about 20 minutes and, and other periods of time, you hear what's, what's being said. So all the voices that you hear in that room can, came from the duration of the installation. So you're hearing you know, all the stuff at the same time that's come from different times. Does that make sense? So anyways, that was a lot of fun. And people, uh, I think, enjoyed like uh, speaking into it. And then when you speak into it and speak into it, you start talking to yourself. It's really kind of a bizarre experience. So, <laughs> so finally, uh, last project. Um, this one's complete, uh, completely out of the space uh, realm. Uh, myself and two others were uh, commissioned by uh, the city of San Jose to, uh, they're, they're building a new concourse there. And actually, I think it's mainly built, but the section that we're in isn't um, all put together yet. But um, we were asked to do a, a hanging sculpture there. And we're going to take, um, this is Aaron Koblen and Nick Hoffermas over here. And we're going to take this, uh, this glass, it's called liquid crystal. And basically, if there's no power, it's opaque. But if you add a little bit of power to it, it becomes transparent. And so basically, these are pixels. Yeah, you like that, yeah. Um, <laughs> he slowly gives away. So um, yeah, so uh, basically, these are all pixels that you can control. And so we thought, why don't we hang like 3,000 of these things from the ceiling, and you have a very large, low-resolution, three-dimensional screen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take real-time weather data from airports around the world that have interesting weather patterns. And Aaron Koblen is a, is a uh, software whiz, and he's going to make really cool patterns that are based upon the weather at these different places around the world. And so there'll be a screen there. It'll say, you know, we're, we're looking at this city, and this is the weather there. And then, you know, you, you'll get a different experience of uh, an abstract experience of what that possibly might be like. And uh, we're putting prototypes together right now, and it should be installed in January. And we'll see what happens. Uh, I guess they, <laughs> uh, because of security, they have to like block it off for six months, and then some year you guys will actually get to see it.